people in this nation who uh, feel profoundly disenfranchised, wounded, in many ways cheated. And we can talk to them about truth and reality, and we can talk about the Bible, and we can talk about statistics and all of that, but sooner or later, that conversation leads to the fact that we have been called to give them the gospel, right? This is why we are here, to give the gospel. So the question that we discussed was, how do we approach people with the gospel? Now last Sunday morning we ended the message by saying our calling is to present the gospel. We are ambassadors for Christ, begging people to be reconciled to God through Christ. How do we open that door? Because that is our calling. It's not enough to stand and analyze something. It is only legitimate to do that if that becomes the foundation on which we act. So I said to these men after about two hours plus of talking together, and it was a very gracious and loving communication, I said, so give me five things that we need to do as believers in Jesus Christ to reach across racial lines and bring the gospel to these people and have it received. So I said, you get five shots, and I'll have this as the introduction to my sermon. So here we go. This is what they said to me. Number one, tell people that racism is a sin. Racism is a sin, isn't it? Any kind of hate is a sin. And racism is an utterly irrational hate. Racism is what causes genocide, what caused the Holocaust, what causes ethnic battles all across the planet as long as there's been human history. But then men in their natural state hate God, and the Bible says they hate each other. The first crime was a murder based upon anger, based upon hate when Cain killed his brother. Any kind of hate is a sin. Any kind of racial hate is an irrational, expanded form of hate. Coming from any human heart, it is reflective of the fallenness of that heart. And we also know in our society that there are some people who have received more of that than others. We need to make it very clear that to hate anyone on any basis or any group of people is a sin against God of monumental proportions. Secondly, we need to show compassion, compassion to those who have experienced this, and lots of people have. We need to open our hearts and weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Jesus looked at the multitudes and had compassion. Even when He went to the grave of Lazarus, He wept. And He knew He was going to raise Him from the dead, and He still wept. That's the heart of Jesus. Life is hard, and it has been especially hard for some groups of people, and that certainly speaks to the issue of the history of black people in America. For those of us who know and love the, the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't want to hear the statistics, but they would love to know you have compassion for them. Thirdly, we talked about the fact that we need to listen, and that, that's pretty much a basic principle, isn't it? Slow to speak and quick to hear. Um, we may have all the theological answers, we may have all the statistical answers, but can we keep our mouths closed long enough to hear the heart of someone else? Engaging someone with the gospel is so much more effective if uh, 
that comes in the context of having heard their heart. Number four, they said, use these days as an opportunity to show the love of Christ. This was really rich advice for me. Say racism is a sin, and it is, any kind of hate coming from anybody in any direction, and you can see that it is tearing this culture to shreds. Show compassion. Listen and use these opportunities as an occasion to show love. That's four. We've got one more. And the final one was this. The only thing that's going to break the cycle of our problems in this country is godly fathers. Help us develop godly fathers. Now you might say that was the providence of God that it happened the week of Father's Day. Sure set me up for this morning because I want to talk about fathers. Here's the current reality. Twenty-five million children in our country live without a biological father, one out of three. Grades 1 to 12, 40 percent of children live without a biological father in the home. Over 50 percent currently of children are born outside marriage. Eighty-five percent of prisoners grew up in a fatherless home. Eighty-five percent of children with behavioral disorders came from fatherless homes. Ninety percent of youth who run away and become homeless come from fatherless homes. Children from fatherless homes are three-hundred percent more likely to deal drugs and carry weapons. This is a holocaust, and it's not limited to any group of ethnic people. It is a national holocaust. The statistics I gave you are across the board for our country. Just that one statistic, 85 percent of prisoners grew up in a fatherless home is a terrifying reality. I used to hear when I was a kid that... um, If you had a good mother, you could have any old stick for a dad. That's not true. I used to hear when I was a kid preachers say, you men, it's important how you live, you Christian men, because your children will get their view of God from you. That's ridiculous. They don't get their view of God from me. They get their view of God from the Bible. That's an insult to God. What they do get from me is their view of a man. Children will get their view of a man and what a man is from the Father. Sexual immorality, relentless assault of feminism, overexposure to perversion, complete collapse of homes has just produced generations of bad fathers. And the reality is nothing is more devastating to a society than that, nothing. And on the other hand, the only hope for stability and the only hope for sanity, the only hope for peace in a society is masculine, virtuous men. Evil abounds absolutely everywhere. How men respond 
to its presence determines the survival and well-being of a society. Let me say that again. Evil abounds everywhere. How men respond to its presence determines the survival and well-being of that society. One psychologist said, masculinity is taking responsibility to reduce evil and produce good. No culture will ever rise above the character of its men, fathers. The feminist lie has been that patriarchy is, is bad, it is tyrannical, it is toxic, it needs to be destroyed. And they've been doing it for decades. To destroy masculinity, to destroy strong male leadership and character leads to the current disaster. Irresponsible men running loose in the streets, terrorizing a society. Weak men have given us this legacy. Weak men produce the death of society. And men are in a crisis today. They are being continually told to try to get in touch with their feminine side. So they have become defensive about their masculinity. Women rise higher and higher and higher and more frequently into positions of leadership as men feel overwhelmed and overpowered and unable to fight against the trend. Oh, there are lots of men at the gym, pretty buff. They have some muscles, but they're doing virtually nothing to stop the tide of evil in the world. And by the way, in case women haven't begun to realize it, weak, immoral men abuse women. And they produce more weak, immoral sons. No, children don't get their view of God from their father, but they do get their view of what a man is. And we are in some serious trouble because the current crop of men are infecting the children. Listen to the Word of God, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation of them that hate Me." Listen to Exodus 34, 7, God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. God says it again in Deuteronomy 5. 9 and 10, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the third and fourth generation of those who hate Me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love Me and keep My commandments. Repeatedly God says, corrupt fathers create in society a legacy of corruption that is generational. He's not saying that a son would be punished for a father's sin. Clearly that is not the case. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, "'Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone will be put to death for his own sin.'" We're not talking about an individual suffering punishment for another person's sin. What we are saying is fathers, plural, who are corrupt, leave a legacy that will not be overturned in three or four generations. And if the next generation is corrupt, it pushes that out another three or four, and the next generation another three or four, and it becomes an impossible cycle. In the words of the prophet Zechariah, 
as he begins his prophecy, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to Me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers. Something has to break the cycle. Clearly a generation dominated by sinful fathers will bear the crushing consequence of their sinful progenitors. Their children will suffer, their grandchildren will suffer, their great-grandchildren will suffer. No generation exists in isolation or as an island. A wicked society defined as wicked by the behavior of the men won't be rooted out for multiple generations. So it isn't that people get their view of God from a father, but they do get their view of what a father is, and if it's the wrong view, it just purposely repeated again and again and again. How can we break the cycle of this generational iniquitous masculinity? We can begin by understanding that this is natural to the human heart. The default position of every man is corruption, right? It's the most natural thing they do is sin. The most accessible effect of that sin is on the women in their lives, and then on the children in their lives, and then it extends to everybody else. The problem is there's none righteous, no, not one. They're all evil, as we read in Romans 3. They don't seek after God. They hate God. They hate others. And they're influencing their children while they're harming their wives. I understand why there's a woman's movement, and even though it's wrong and totally devastates the society, pushes women into places they were never intended to be and men out of the places they were intended to be, I understand it because of the corruption of men. So where do we begin? We have to begin as believers who have new natures, right? We are new creations. In Christ we have the Holy Spirit, and we start by breaking the cycle. It's not going to be broken. Look, it's still around, right? What you're seeing today in the chaos of this culture, what you see in the weakness and foolishness of people in high places. What you see is just the reality that corrupt fathers destroy society. We talk about abortions. Abortions are another result of corrupt men. We can start as believers by understanding the most basic fundamental virtue, the core virtue of manliness. The word I like to use is fortitude. Mark it down in your mind. You don't need to write it down. I'm going to say it enough you won't forget it. Fortitude. What is fortitude? It's a great word. Firmness, strength of soul that faces danger with courage and bears loss and pain without complaint. Fortitude. Firmness and strength of soul that faces danger with courage and bears loss and pain without complaint. That's not a theological definition. That's just a definition of the Word. When you say a man has fortitude, you're talking about someone who doesn't compromise. Even when there's danger, even when that danger escalates to, to fear and pain, fortitude is a 
combination of conviction, courage, and endurance. Conviction, courage, and endurance. It is the willingness... It is not just the willingness, I would say, it's even the desire to risk, to literally create challenges if they're not already there, to attack difficulty, to challenge difficulty head-on, to bear suffering with courage. This is what makes a man a man. And this is the kind of man in whom a woman finds her security, finds her protection. And in that kind of relationship, the woman's femininity flourishes. Men are those who should be the protectors, the purifiers, who secure their wives, who secure their children, who accomplish all that needs to be done to reduce evil in a society and produce good. And yet this society for years and decades has had men busy producing evil and diminishing good. True manliness is bound up in the word courage. That is the virtue that marks a real man. Truth, conviction, courage. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. At the end of this wonderful letter, near the end, is tucked a very important verse. Actually, two verses, verses 13 and 14. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Be on the alert. Dangers everywhere. Stand firm in the faith. Don't waver in your belief and convictions. Act like men. What does that mean? Fortitude, uncompromising courage, be strong. The New King James actually says, be brave, be strong. Act like men essentially means to conduct oneself in a courageous way, to conduct oneself in a courageous way. Courage is the stock and trade of a man. Courage in the face of danger, courage in the face of temptation, courage in the face of loss, courage in the face of suffering. The strength of verse 13, essentially four statements saying one way or another, be strong, is then balanced in verse 14 by, let all that you do be done in love. And how important is it to add that? There's nothing more manly than a man with consummate conviction, courage, and endurance who is marked by love. That's a man, not weak, not vacillating, not fearful, and loving. Real men face life with this kind of fortitude. They're watchful of the dangers around them. They're alert. They're protectors of their wives and children and of their friends and all the people over whom they have influence. They have convictions about what is true. They have courage to live out those convictions and the strength to be unwavering when those convictions will cost them everything. 
Your convictions are only real convictions if they hold up under the most intense pressure. How important was this? Let me, let me take you back to the book of Deuteronomy. We'll do a little exercise together in looking at this idea of strength, fortitude. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses is uh, passing the mantle on to Joshua, and in verse 6, Deuteronomy 31, he says this, "'Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them,' meaning your enemies, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed." That's the greatest transitional leadership speech ever. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 10. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel. I knew there was something wrong about that. 2 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 12. This is Joab to the Israelites who are facing opposition, strong opposition, tremendously strong opposition. Back in verse 6, it lays out the forces that were coming against them. But in verse 12, Joab says to the Israelites, be strong. And let us show ourselves courageous for the sake of our people and for the cities of our God, and may the Lord do what is good in His sight." First Kings chapter 2. In First Kings chapter 2, David addresses Solomon, his son. David's time to die drew near. He charged Solomon, his son, saying, I'm going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, His commandments, His ordinances, and His testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn so that the Lord may carry out His promise which He spoke. Moses to Joshua, Joab to the Israelites, David to Solomon. For another view of David's speech to his son Solomon, look at First Chronicles chapter 22. I'm showing you these because I want you to see how common this is. First Chronicles 22. David calls for his son to build the house of God, and we can pick it up in verse 11. "'Now, my son, the Lord be with you, that you may be successful and build the house of the Lord your God, just as He has spoken concerning you. Only the Lord give you discretion and understanding, and give you charge over Israel, so that you may keep the law of the Lord your God then you will prosper if you're careful to observe the statutes and ordinances which the Lord commanded Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear nor be dismayed." All of these declarations assume that your devotion to God is going to be tested, and you're going to have to be strong. 
It's going to be tested. No way around it. David says again, 1 Chronicles 28, 20, to his son Solomon. He gives this speech another time. Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, my God, is with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. Just a couple more. Toward the end of Second Chronicles, Hezekiah is speaking to men in positions of leadership. Hezekiah, chapter 32 of uh, Second Chronicles. The first verse, after these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib king of Assyria came, invaded Judah, besieged the fortified cities, and thought to break into them for himself. Hezekiah saw that uh, Sennacherib had come invading Judah. He intended to make war on Jerusalem. He decided with his officers and warriors to cut off the supply of water from the springs. This was a siege which were outside the city, and they helped him. So many people assembled and stopped up all the springs and streams which flowed through the region, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find abundant water? And he took courage and rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down and erected towers on it, built another outside wall, strengthened the millow in the city of David, made weapons and shields in great number, appointed military officers over the people, and gathered them in the square of the city gate and spoke encouragingly to them. And this is what he said, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him, for the one with us is greater than the one with him. With him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles." That's a great pep talk, isn't it, for an army? Psalm 27, 14 says, "'Be strong and let your heart take courage. Men don't give in to fear. Men don't give in to pressure. Men don't give in to intimidation. And they don't give in to temptation. They don't seek the easy way. They will take the pain. They will invite the risk. They will confront the challenge. And they will not bow to the pressure to compromise the commandments of God. The strength of a man is that he lives on principle, that he lives on conviction, that he has the courage of those convictions, stands strong against everything that comes at those convictions, bravely faces the challenges in a fortified way. Manly fortitude means contending with difficulty, facing every enemy meeting the enemy head-on, bearing the pain, maintaining self-discipline, upholding truth, pressing on to the goal. That's what defines a man. I want to show you another passage back in Joshua, right at the beginning of Joshua. Moses gives this speech again as he passes the baton, as it were, to Joshua. He says to him in chapter 1 of Joshua, verse 5, "'No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you.'" This is God now speaking. God is the one speaking. "'Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you.'" So here it comes not from Moses to Joshua, but from God to Joshua in the presence of Moses. And here's what God says to Joshua, verse 6, "'Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go.'" And here comes the key to that. How do you live like that? How do you live with that strength and courage? How do you live without ever compromising? Verse 8, "'This book of the law, the Word of God, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then 
you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go." This is an incredible speech from God. Be strong, verse 5, because God will be with you. Verse 6, because you're fulfilling a divine cause, a promise from God. Verses 7 and 8, the only way you can do this is to submit to the Word of God so that it constantly is in your mind and you live out its truths. You will be able to be obedient if you're saturated by the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. Can you see why this speech is repeated so many, many times? This is the mark of a man. It takes a father like that to raise a son like that. Spiritual men are courageous, strong principled, uncompromising, and bold. This is God's role for men to play in a society, but it is also God's role for the men to play who are the leaders of His people Israel. And this is God's standard for the men who lead His church. When we come into the New Testament and we are introduced to the kind of men that the Lord commands to lead His church, this is how He describes them in 1 Timothy 3. This man must be above reproach, a one-woman man, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. If a man doesn't know how to manage his own children, how will he take care of the church of God and not a new convert so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil? And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. High standards for a pastor, an elder. To Titus, Paul says similarly, Appoint elders. If a man is above reproach, a one-woman man, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer or the shepherd, pastor, bishop must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he'll be able to exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. This is the kind of men who lead the church. Why is the standard so high for the leaders of the church? Because the leaders of the church have the responsibility to set the pattern for what manliness looks like in a godly environment. It's not that they alone should be like this, it is that they should be like this so the others can see what a man should be. It isn't that the Lord wants to pick up all the pastors and elders and take them to another level of spirituality which no one could attain. It is rather that this is what God expects from every man. But it's got to be modeled. Men like that and men, as Ephesians 5 said, who love their wives like Christ loved the church and who are protectors of their wives and who literally are the saviors of their wives are the kind of men who become a haven for the wife, who make her feel secure, protected, nourished, cherished. And when children grow up in a home where the man secures the woman and the children, there's peace. Sometimes you hear silly things about how fathers should connect with their children, superficial things. 
what you need to show your children is fortitude, spiritual fortitude, strong, courageous, secure love for the Lord and for the family. The legacy of a man to his wife and children is strength, spiritual strength and spiritual courage. Anything but cowardice means to resist the temptation to compromise biblical convictions, to resist the temptation to tolerate behaviors in others that dishonor God. That's why there's discipline in the church. There's discipline in the church so that the church can maintain the necessary reality of what men and women should be before God for the sake of the glory of God and the next generation. Being a good father is far more than spending time with your children, playing with your children, hauling them around to events. It's showing them what an uncompromising, courageous, godly life looks like. This culture has turned on God, eliminated His Word. The Bible and the gospel is an enemy. The leaders of this nation have no interest in God or in His Word. And they are basically running this country right into hell as fast as they can. The only thing that's going to stop this is not a group of feminized men who thinks God just wants to give them what they want so they can be happy. What this world needs is not sensitive men. It needs strong men. We live in a world of compromise, more than compromise. You could barely call it compromise because there's nothing left of that which is good, so what are they compromising with? To add another word to your thoughts about this, I would say that people who have no price have integrity, integrity. So we talk about fortitude, let me talk about integrity. People who have no price have integ integrity. What is integrity? It, it is essentially unbreakable fortitude. Integrity is defined as steadfast adherence to a moral code. It comes from integer, which means whole or complete. Its synonyms are honesty, sincerity, simplicity, incorruptibility. Its antonym is duplicity or hypocrisy. A person who lacks integrity is a hypocrite. Integrity means that you live by your convictions. You say what you believe, you hold to what you believe, you're immovable. That's wholeness. That's integrity. You are one. It was said long ago of a preacher that he preached very well, but he lived better. The world is a seducer, and Satan is a seducing deceiver, pushing us into compromise and therefore into hypocrisy. When our Lord indicted the scribes and Pharisees who were the frequent objects of his blistering attacks. Inevitably, it was on their integrity that He assaulted them. For example, in Matthew 23, 3, He said, they say things and do not do them. When Solomon did finish building the house of the Lord, the Lord